Welcome okay, back to this um, lecture 27 of our course on applied quant on advanced quantum mechanics. In the previous lecture, <clears throat> we faced the fact that we often don't quite know what state our system is in. In this, say, in this case, we said that the system is in a mixed state. So, Call. Well, assume that the probability um, for the system to be described, um, for the system to be in a state uh, Bn out of some Hilbert basis of vectors Bn, assume that this probability is some number Pn for each n. Then we say that the system is in a mixed state. And that mixed state is described by a so-called density operator or density matrix. And it is defined to be the sum over all n and then the probabilities multiplied with Bn, Bn. This is a very convenient notation because then, um, we can express all of our ignorance, all of these, all of the, well, all our knowledge, in fact, um, in a compact form. See, probability, if we do know the probabilities for the system to be in a particular uh, state, then we do know at least something. Now, what are the properties of this row hat? Well, we have that the trace of row hat is the sum of the diagonal elements. Well, sum of the diagonal elements, that's the sum of the Pn, right? So, and the sum of the Pn is of course one. So this is one because the sum over all n Pn is equal to one. <clears throat> now, um, we also have that rho hat is self adjoint. And we also developed a way to measure or to quantify how much we know or don't know about the state that the system is actually in. So how much ignorance do we have about the state? How much ignorance? We did this with information theoretic methods. Namely, we defined um, the so-called von Neumann entropy. So the von Neumann entropy of a density operator rho is defined as minus the trace of rho hat ln rho hat. Now, since the density matrix is a self adjoint operator, we can go into its eigenbasis, in which case the trace is just the sum over the diagonal elements. So therefore, this is equal to minus sum over n, and then um, the Pn ln Pn. Actually, later we will rename them into rho n because they are actually the eigenvalues of our operator rho hat. So this is equal to minus um, sum over n rho n ln rho n. So definition rho n equal to pn. Eigenvalues of Rho hat. So this is called the phenomenon entropy. And how do we calculate predictions now, now that we have a density matrix? Well, predictions are now calculated this way. The expectation value from observable f is equal to the trace of 
rho hat f hat. And we can write this out. For example, the trace we can calculate in any basis we want. We could calculate it in the eigenbasis of f or in the eigenbasis of rho or any other eigenbasis we want. But if we write it, for example, in the eigenbasis of the rho hat, then this would be the sum over all n rho n b n f hat b n. Now, how can we calculate these probabilities? So, how to calculate the probabilities? Um, well, the probabilities rho n. For example, um, let's say we look at a molecule such as a, uh, an O2 molecule, so two atoms of oxygen forming a diatomic molecule O2 uh, that is floating around in the air. This molecule um, consists of two nuclei of oxygen and the electronic clouds around them. This molecule can fly around in the air, but also it has internal degrees of freedom. It can get excited. In particular, the molecule could spin, it, the, the two nuclei could spin around each other. And also the two nuclei can vibrate relative to each other. Now, Let's consider such an O2 molecule in the air. Then how would we know what state this molecule is in? For example, how much it might be spinning around itself or how much the nuclei might be vibrating against each other. The, our O2 molecule is being kicked around like a football in the air because it constantly bumps into neighboring molecules. And sometimes our O2 molecule will gain energy in one of these bumps and sometimes it will lose energy in these bumps. And uh, it will jump from one state to another quantum state depending on what the latest kick by molecules in the environment, in the environment produced. It would seem hopeless we cannot know what the state of our O2 molecule is. And that's true, but we can calculate what the probabilities are for the O2 molecule to be in the one state or the other state or another state. We can calculate the complete probability distribution. And not just for O2 molecules, but generally. Whenever we have um, a small system, such as a molecule, that is in contact with a large system that has a definite temperature, such as a box of gas that's equilibrated in some temperature, then we can calculate for the small system, for the test system, what the probabilities are that it is in the one or the other or the other state. And that is a very important case. It arises uh, not just in physics, but also in um, chemistry and in biology, of course, where we often need to know what is the probability that a particular atom or molecule does the one or the other thing, is in the one or the other state, depending on the ambient temperature. So what we will do now is study how to calculate the density matrix of a small test system that is exposed to a large heat path. And what is meant by that is that the system that provides the environment for our test system is supposed to be big in the sense that its temperature is not going to be affected by the temperature or by the energetic properties of our small test system. So the test system is small compared to the thermal environment. In this case, um, we will 
now calculate what the density matrix of the small test system is as a function of the temperature of the environment. Now, you may wonder, what temperature? In this course, we didn't define the notion of temperature yet. And in fact, in the calculation that we will do today, we will find out how to define temperature. We will arrive at the modern definition of what a temperature is. The old fashioned definition is that the temperature is, you know, what a thermometer reads. But there's a better, an information theoretic definition of what temperature is, and you will automatically arrive at that definition today. So, um, Information theoretic method for calculating row hat for a um, test system. And now you know what test system means. It means small test system in a heat bar. I mean, strictly speaking, we assume that our test system has been exposed to the heat bath. And then we ask, what is its state now? Of course, the next kick can put it into a different pure state. But we are asking, the system has been in contact with the heat bath. What is its mixed state density matrix now? So the information theoretic method works this way. First of all, we collect what we do know about rho. About rho hat. Usually we don't know much about it, but we do know a few things for sure. For example, we do know A, uh, I guess I don't need this box if I write A. What we do know, is that the trace um, of rho hat is equal to one because the probabilities have to sum up to one. Now that's certainly not enough to allow us to calculate what rho hat is. What else do we know? Well, we know that the energy expectation value um, of our system, so the trace of rho hat Hamiltonian, we know that that energy expectation value is um, not infinite. Um, that would be surprising if a system was to pick up an infinite amount of energy. And so we just give it a name. We say that the energy expectation value of our system is some value E bar. And we know that the hotter the system of the environment is, the larger the E bar of our test system is going to be. I mean, just intuitively, we know that. So we know already that the E bar is going to have something to do with the temperature of the ambient system, but we haven't even defined temperature yet. So let's just keep that in mind. Right, what else do we know about our density matrix? Well, we know that after a while, after a while of contact, with the bath, um, we have um, equilibrium. We have that the density matrix doesn't change anymore. We have that d rho hat by dt is equal to zero. Right, so initially, for example, we may have, we may know what state our um, oxygen molecule is in. So it's in a pure state. The density matrix is just the projector onto that state and the phenomenon entropy is zero. But then we let this 
we let our oxygen molecule interact with the gas, with the environment. And then pretty quickly after that, we lose track of what state our system is in because it will have been kicked around like a football for a while. And then we can only assign probabilities to what state the system might be in, which means that our density matrix has changed from a pure state density matrix to a mixed state density matrix. And that happens very, very quickly. So this thermalization happens very quickly. <coughs> and once that has happened, the probabilities no longer change. So we have this equilibrium here. Equilibrium. We also say that it has thermalized. Now, if we know more, if we know more, we must list it here. And in some situations, um, we do. For example, the system that we might be considering um, may contain a variable number of particles. And then in that case, for example, it could be a box with photons in it. And then photons may come in and photons may come up. And maybe we know that the photon number is finite and then we give it a name and we call it N bar. Things like that. Now, in the case of um, an oxygen molecule in air, um, that's not applicable, but um, in general, we have to be open to the possibility that we know more facts about our density matrix. In this case, these facts ought to be listed here under point one. And then the method continues with point two. Remember this A, B, C, D, etc. that's point one of our method for calculating the density matrix of a system. So what is point two now? Well, point two is the realization that we have maximum uh, ignorance about the rest of the properties of rho hat. Now, you might shrug and say, well, duh, yeah. But what can we do about it? Now, amazingly, um, this statement is very valuable because it can be put into the form of a mathematical principle, a maximum ignorance principle, from which we can calculate how rho looks like. Namely, so the method consists in stating point one, stating point two, and then the um, state rho that we want to calculate is the is that state rho which maximizes the von Neumann entropy subject to what we do know, subject to the constraints um, A, B, C, etc. if there are more of them. Now it might seem far-fetched that we get that we get away with this, but we do simply by saying that the, the correct density matrix should be that density matrix which expresses maximum ignorance, therefore maximum von Neumann entropy, subject to the condition that we do know what we claimed in ABC, etc., to know. Well, that density matrix is 
already defined, is already calculable from this little bit of information only. Now, I hope you remember how the method of Lagrange multipliers works. Because we're going to use it now to solve this extremization principle. So, solve this um, problem of constrained, uh, let me write it legibly, constrained optimization um, using the method of um, Lagrange multipliers. How does that work? Remember, if we want to extremize, let's say optimize a quantity such as the Fourier Neumann entropy or whatever else it might be, if we want to extremize a quantity, then um, we differentiate it with respect to the parameters and set the derivative equal to zero because that will give us the critical points. And then we can check them whether they're maxima or uh, minima or settle points. However, when the quantity that we want to optimize, or let's say maximize, like in our case, we want to maximize the phenomenon entropy, when it's not freely to be optimized, but subject to constraints, such as, for example, if the trace of rho has to be one, then how do we do this? Now, the, the method of Lagrange multipliers helps, of it, helps us with that because the method of Lagrange multipliers allows us to rewrite a constrained optimization problem as an unconstrained optimization problem. And unconstrained optimization problems are relatively straightforward because we simply have to differentiate with respect to all the parameters and set the derivatives equal to zero, and that will put us onto the extremal points or at least onto the critical points. So, um, namely, namely, <clears throat> we turn it into an unconstrained optimization problem Um, in uh, um, more variables. That's the price we have to pay for getting rid of um, having to do it, a constraint optimization. And these extra variables are called the Lagrange multipliers. Multipliers. Okay, how do we do this? Well, in our case, our aim is to maximize the entropy, right? So let's write down what we want to extremize here. We take the trace of the density matrix times the logarithm of the density matrix. Remember, we use in physics the natural logarithm, so we're measuring the information or the lack of information, not in bits, but in nuts. So this is the ignorance here. This is ignorance. And we want to calculate the state row of maximum ignorance, subject to the condition that we do know a few things. So what we do now is we add to that a Lagrange multiplier times the first constraint. The first constraint is that the trace of rho hat h hat minus <clears throat> the energy expectation value 
is equal to zero. Right? Remember that is something we had here. Um, here. Well, I started with B, but I might have as well started with A. So the trace of rho hat e, h hat minus e bar is equal to zero. That's one of the constraints. So um, that's one of the constraints. <coughs> and why we put it here with the minus lambda will become clear in a moment. And then we'd also do minus mu. And then the second constraint, actually it was our constraint A, which is that the trace of rho hat is equal to one. So these are the two constraints here. And then this is a Lagrange multiplier. And that is a Lagrange multiplier. So we introduce those arbitrary variables now, lambda and mu. And now we define we give this thing a name. Let's call it Q of rho hat, lambda, and mu. So if we didn't know anything about our um, uh, density matrix, then we would have to simply extremize the ignorance. But we do know some things, such as that the trace is one, and the energy expectation is some value E bar. So what we now do is we extremize the quantity Q with respect to rho hat, with respect to lambda, and with respect to mu, but no further constraints. Why does this work? Well, let's see, we extremize And in particular, this means that we must have dq by d lambda is equal to zero. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's differentiate this whole thing with respect to lambda. And then what we get is that trace of rho hat h hat equal to e bar, right? Because we get that this bracket has to vanish. Uh, similarly, Let's differentiate with respect to the variable mu, dq by d mu equal to zero, right? We have to set the derivative with respect to all variables equal to zero because we want to do optimization with respect to everything. So the gradient has to vanish um, for differentiations in all directions. <clears throat> okay, so dq by d mu is equal to zero. And what is the um, Euler-Lagrange equation for that? Remember, when you have a variational principle such as here, um, you can also call the result an euler lagrange equation. Um, so we have dq by d mu equal to zero, and that means that the trace of rho is equal to one. So trace of rho hat is equal to one. So what we see is that the constraints pop out as part of the extremization conditions. So that's automatically implemented here. So what we still to do, what we now still have to do is this, we have to, in order to find out what the row hat is, we also have to extremize with respect to row hat. So now we also have to calculate the dq by d row hat equal to zero. But what is this? It appears that we have to differentiate with respect to an operator. How on earth do you differentiate um, with respect to an operator? Of course, you better not differentiate with respect to an operator because we haven't defined how to do that yet. There is such a thing, but we don't need the full theory for this. It turns out that um, by using something else that we know about rho hat, namely, point C, we can do this. See, no information goes to waste here. We know we have implemented this, we have implemented B, and now let's implement C as well. So what we do know is that after a while of contact with the heat path, our density matrix has settled. The density matrix doesn't change anymore. It's a fixed mixed state now. 
So what we have is the d rho by dt is equal to zero. But what does that mean? Well, so um, recall. Uh, so sorry, it's so very it's very difficult to uh, to write here. So uh, remember, we have that d by dt. Um, from C, from C, we have the d by dt of rho hat of t is equal to zero. But now by von Neumann, we have that ih bar d by dt rho hat of t <clears throat> is equal to h hat <clears throat> rho hat of t. So we can conclude that actually um, h hat and rho hat of t, actually it's no longer time dependent, right, is equal to zero. So we have that h hat rho hat is equal to zero. But since the Hamiltonian is self-adjoint and the density matrix is self-adjoint, and since they commute, we can conclude that in thermal equilibrium, H hat and rho hat are diagonal in the same basis. <clears throat> now, for simplicity, um, assume that um, the spectrum of H hat um, is purely discrete. discrete, so there's only a point spectrum, purely discrete and non-degenerate. This is not a fundamental problem. The generalization to um, uh, other spectra and um, non and degenerate uh, eigenvalues is, is definitely possible and relatively straightforward, but um, it would be tedious. Uh, notationally to keep track of this. So in that case then, we have that the energy eigenvectors are the, um, are the density matrix eigenvectors. Because they're the same basis. The eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian is the eigenbasis of the density matrix. The eigenvalues can be very different, but the eigenvectors um, are the same. And so now we can choose to um, write our equation um, above. Let's write it like this, this equation star here. Let's write this equation where we have the phenomenon entropy here, and then we have the energy constraint and the trace constraint. Um, let's write this now, not abstractly, but in the eigenbasis, in the row and base basis. Choose to write equation star in the row n basis, which is also the E n basis. So then what we have is that Q of rho hat lambda and mu is equal to minus, well, and then what is this? The trace of rho log rho. Well, in the eigenbasis, it is sum over rho n logarithm rho n, 
we had this before. And of course, you can just insert resolutions of the identity and convince yourself of that. And then we have the energy constraint. We have minus lambda, and then we have the sum over n rho n e n minus e bar. Why is that? Well, what is this? This is the trace of rho hat h hat. When you just spell it out in the eigenbasis of rho, this is an h. And similarly, this is, of course, the trace of rho hat ln rho hat. We're not done yet. We also have minus mu. And then um, the sum over all n, or the rho n, and minus one, because this is, of course, just a trace of rho hat. All right, so we've now expressed our functional that needs to be extremized in the rho n basis. And you see, now we can differentiate. We differentiated with respect to lambda. That was not a problem before, and we differentiated with respect to mu. But now we can also differentiate with respect to, not rho hat, but each of its parameters, namely the rho n. So we can do that. Um, so let's do this. <clears throat> now extremize. So we calculate d by d rho n, and we do it for all n, of course, of q of rho hat lambda and mu, and we set that equal to zero for all n, i.e. Um, what do we obtain? Well, if we differentiate this expression here with respect to rho n, what do we get? Well, we get a minus. That's this minus here. And then let's say we differentiate this factor here. Well, we sum over all n here. Actually, maybe let's write here m, not to confuse it with the summation here. So we differentiate with respect to rho m. Then out of this entire series here, only one term survives, namely the one that has a rho m here and a rho m there. So what you obtain here is if you differentiate that term, we get a one multiplied with the log of rho m. So we get minus ln rho m. And then we also have a term where we leave this one alone and differentiate that term. But when we differentiate the logarithm of rho m with respect to rho m, we get one over rho m, which cancels this rho m. So we just have a one. So minus one. And then we have to differentiate this expression here with respect to rho m. And then what survives is minus lambda and then the em. em. And from down here, when we differentiate, we get a minus mu. And then, well, when we differentiate the rho m with respect to rho m, which is the one, just get a one. So this then is equal to zero. And that's true for all m. Okay, so this is our so to speak, our Lagrange equations, our extremization condition. Um, these are our extremization conditions. We can rewrite this now in operator form. Um, so multiply with um, rho m, rho m, and sum over m. Well, then what do we get? Then we get this exact equation here, where every time, oh, let me just write it out. It's probably faster than just saying it in words. So we have this, and then we have rho m, rho m, and well, sum over m, and then minus, um, rho m 
rho m. I'm here at this term now, the minus one. And then we also have um, minus lambda sum over m, and then we have bm rho m rho m um, minus mu rho m rho m. Uh, here's the sum over m, and here is the sum over m. And this is equal to zero, right? So we've just taken this equation, multiplied with this projector, and then summed over all m. And now what we obtain is this. You obtain, therefore, that minus the logarithm of rho hat, because that's what this is, right? This is minus the logarithm of rho hat. Because any function you do on the diagonal elements is the function you do on the operator. And then minus, well, what is this? This is a resolution of the identity. So we have here the identity operator. And then we have minus lambda times this. But what is this? Remembering that this is equal to the energy eigenvector, right? We have that this is energy eigenvalue times energy eigenvectors here. So this is just a Hamiltonian. So this whole thing, but with the, with the sum, this is equal to h hat. Okay, so minus the Hamiltonian. And what do we have here? Another resolution of the identity multiplied with minus mu. So minus mu resolution of the identity is equal to zero. Now we have one operator equation instead of having infinitely many of these ordinary number valued um, equations. Now we see that we have two resolutions of the identity here. So let us introduce uh, a new variable. We define mu prime to be equal to mu plus one. And when we do that, then we have that we can write that the logarithm of rho hat is equal to minus lambda the Hamiltonian minus mu prime the identity operator. <clears throat> I just solved that equation here for the logarithm of rho hat. And now we exponentiate that equation. Now we obtain rho hat is equal to e to the power of minus mu prime times the identity minus lambda Hamiltonian. Now this is, this we can also write more easily as e to the power minus mu prime, that's just a number, times e to the power minus lambda Hamiltonian. Why is that? It's because the, the identity matrix exponentiated is still proportional to the identity matrix. And therefore, we can just put this out as a factor in front of everything. Because this will then also multiply um, all the diagonal elements of this operator with that number here. Okay, so we arrived at an expression for the density matrix. So what we have is rho hat equal to e to the power minus mu prime e to the power minus lambda h hat. Ha, huh. are we done? We have calculated the density matrix all right, but we don't know what the meaning of lambda and mu prime is we still have to figure that out. Because they were just introduced as Lagrange multipliers. What their meaning is, will still need to be determined. How come that we have two unknowns here? Well, it's because we had two constraints. These are two Lagrange multipliers and we have two constraints. So we use the two constraints to figure out what mu prime is and what lambda is. So now, 
uh, determine new prime and lambda using the constraints. Um, so first of all, um, we have this constraint. We have that the trace of rho hat is equal to one. And the other constraint is that the trace of rho hat h hat is some energy expectation. And remember, we think that the energy expectation as it rises indicates that our environment is at a higher temperature, <clears throat> right? The higher the temperature of the environment, the larger the energy expectation for the system that's exposed to that environment. Okay, let's do this systematically now. Um, um, so we use this condition first. So what do we have? We have that the trace of rho hat is one. So the trace of this has to be one. So from this, we have that the trace of E minus mu prime E minus lambda h hat is equal to one. So therefore, because this is just a number, we have that E minus mu prime times the trace of E minus lambda h hat is equal to one. And from that, we obtain that E minus mu prime is equal to one over the trace of E minus lambda h hat. And therefore, we can now write our density matrix with this factor replaced by what we now know it is. So we obtain that rho hat is equal to one over um, the trace of E minus lambda h hat e to the power minus lambda h hat. Now that's good. So now we have expressed the density matrix in terms of the Hamiltonian and in terms of this mysterious variable lambda that um, is a Lagrange multiplier. And the whole thing arose from the general principle that we are maximizing our ignorance while acknowledging what we do know as constraints. What we do know about the density matrix. All right, so we've arrived here now. And there's one more constraint, namely this one. We also have this constraint. And from this constraint, we have what? Well, we have that the expectation value of the energy is E bar. So this is coming from the second constraint. Um, we have that the trace of rho hat h hat, um, which is E bar, is equal to, well, it's one over the trace of E minus lambda h hat, because that's just a number, and then trace of h hat E minus lambda h hat. Right, so we've just taken the rho hat, multiplied it with h hat here, h hat, and then took the trace of the whole thing. And this is just a number, so we can, because it's a trace, it's just a number, we can pull that out uh, of the trace. So what we are left with is finally this equation here. The 
This is almost the end result. So what we have here is that the energy expectation is expressed in terms of the Hamiltonian and some mystery variable lambda. What could this lambda be? Well, let's see. What happens if we choose lambda very, very large? Well, if you choose lambda very large, then we have e to the power of minus something very large, multiplying some Hamiltonian here, which for example, could be harmonic oscillator or hydrogen atom or whatever, positive eigenvalues there. So as lambda grows very large, this gets very small. And that trace starts diminishing. So as lambda goes um, very, very large, and the E bar gets smaller. On the other hand, what happens if um, uh, lambda grows small? If lambda goes small, then, then the energy will, the energy expectation will grow. So let's compare that with what you would expect for the energy expectation of our test system, such as the oxygen molecule, um, what would we expect the energy expectation value to do with respect to the temperature? Remember that when the temperature increases, we expect that our test system, on average, has a higher energy. When the temperature goes down, we expect that the energy expectation of our test system goes down. Here we have the opposite. Here we have that if lambda grows, E bar goes down. If lambda goes down, E bar goes up. Now that gives us a hint that not lambda, but one over lambda might have something to do with the temperature. Because one over lambda grows when E bar grows, and one over lambda diminishes when E bar diminishes. In fact, it is the temperature. This is the modern definition of what a temperature is. Definition. Um, one over lambda is called the temperature of the heat bath. <clears throat> Usually, um, we would write um, uh, notation Notation um, one over lambda is also called KT. So here, this is called the Boltzmann constant. And this is the temperature in Kelvin. Temperature in Kelvin. And the Boltzmann constant is simply the um, conversion factor, namely we between a temperature and an energy. So the Boltzmann factor, the Boltzmann constant, sorry, the Boltzmann constant um, has um, uh, the following value. Boltzmann constant is 1.38 and some digits there times 10 to the minus 23 joule per Kelvin. So that a temperature measured in Kelvin multiplied with the Boltzmann constant gives us an energy in units of, for example, joule, if that's how we measure the energy. So one over lambda then um, has um, the energy um, of, um, has in the units of an energy. 
so that the exponent over here doesn't have um, units because you can only exponentiate numbers. You can never exponentiate something with units because let's say if you exponentiated something with a unit of kilogram, then write out the exponential. What is it? It's one plus exponential of X is one plus X plus one half X squared and so on. Then you would get units of, you know, kilogram squared, kilogram to the third, all added up. That makes no sense. So, um, we also write, um, also, beta um, is um, lambda. That's another um, usual terminology. It's usually the inverse of the temperature is usually not called lambda. It's usually called beta. And this is called the inverse temperature. <clears throat> so the following end result um, therefore we have that the density matrix of a small system exposed to a heat bath is given by 1 over trace of E minus Hamiltonian divided by KT. Hamiltonian has units of energy and KT has units of energy. Multiplied with E to the power minus H hat over KT, which is also sometimes written as one over trace of E minus beta H hat times E minus beta H hat. Now you may wonder why bother with the beta? Why don't we just always write KT? Because after all, isn't it the temperature that we usually measure? And so there should be KT. Well, the reason why it is convenient, it can be convenient to have a beta here, is that this beta in more advanced calculations plays a role that's very similar to I times T. I times T. You see, E to the power minus I T, the Hamiltonian, is the time evolution of wave. And E to the power minus beta, the Hamiltonian, gives us the density matrix for a system in thermal equilibrium with its environment. And that's curious. Um, it's actually deeper than just a, uh, uh, a coincidence. You can calculate things such as the Hawking radiation of a black hole by playing with this similarity. Um, there is in fact a notion of Wick rotation where you can turn um, the time axis by 90 degrees in the complex plane, and then you go from a picture like this to a picture like that, and vice versa. But that would take us too far um, for today. So the main result um, of today then is this. Density, we know now how to calculate the density matrix of a system um, in a heat bath and in the exercises, so you will calculate that for some simple systems. Um, one open question that you may have is, what is the origin of this weird number there? Because it has more digits here, 1.38, etc. Is that a fundamental um, constant of nature, the Boltzmann constant? No, it's not. It's completely human made. And the reason is that Kelvins is a weird human made unit. What are Kelvins? They have the same spacings as degrees Celsius. Sure, Kelvin starts canonically, Kelvins start canonically at zero Kelvin at absolute zero temperature. 
But then the spacing is derived from the Celsius temperature scale. And the Celsius temperature scale um, is designed such that it runs from zero to 100 between water uh, freezing and water boiling. So that's just the property of, of water. And um, clearly that's not related um, in any simple fashion to the fundamental constants of nature. We could have, for example, chosen to define our Celsius not as freezing to boiling for water, but freezing to boiling for olive oil or for um, alcohol or whatever, ethanol. But we chose it for water. So this arbitrariness is reflected in the arbitrariness of these digits here. That's uh, nothing fundamental. In fact, generally, the only fundamental constants in nature are dimensionless constants such as the fine structure constant, or such as uh, the fact that the muon is about 207 times heavier than an electron. And these things are not human made. They are not unit dependent. Okay, um, uh, this is as far as we got today. And in the lecture notes, I provide um, some extra information about this topic as well. But in the course, we uh, will move on uh, from here then. Okay, see you next time.